Good morning. Uh, yeah, what do you think, Shai? I think we are enough people. We can start. Yeah, we can start. Yeah. Sure. So, good morning, everyone. Um, today we have Luigi Giannelli, um, who is now based in Catania after a PhD in Saarbrücken at the University of Thailand and a master thesis in Pisa with Arimondo. And uh, yeah, will tell us uh, a bit on the tutorial on optimal control and reinforcement learning methods for quantum technologies that he uh, published recently, right? Right, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. Uh, at the moment, actually, I'm a postdoc in the group of uh, Professor Falch and Professor Paladino. And uh, today I will present this tutorial about optimal control and reinforcement learning for quantum technologies. So, of course, the motivation for these uh, um, topics, you know very well, quantum control is uh, central for most quantum technologies. And uh, quantum optical control is, widely, is a widely used tool for the, for the development of quantum technologies. And the reinforcement learning instead has had the user success in robotics and games. And lately, it has been applied also to quantum problems. And it offers a direct approach to control problems. And uh, so this is what we are going to do. We are just simply trying to solve the control problems with quantum optical control and reinforcement learning. The outline is uh, the following. So I will first introduce the simple control problem that we want to address, which is population transfer interlevel system. And we will also explain what is STIRAP, which is a protocol that allows for population transfer interlevel system with high fidelity. Then I will give a super very short mention of optimal control and its application to the three level system population transfer, because you are expert in optimal control, you know it better than me. Then I will give a brief idea of reinforcement learning and how it can be applied to, a, to the same problem. And in the end, we will conclude with some discussion. So the, the problem that we address is a population transfer in three level systems. So consider a three level system with states G, R, and E. E is the excited state. The states G and E are coupled with the time dependent Rabi frequency we call omega P of T. And instead, the states E and R are coupled with another time dependent Rabi frequency that we call omega S of T. The Hamiltonian, you can see it here on the right. Uh, this is written in, in a rotating frame, so we have only the, the tuning of the laser pulses with the uh, excited state. And then we have the, the pumping of the transitions. Omega P, again, the transition GE, and omega S, the transition ER. We will also consider the K, the K from the excited state E with the K rate gamma, and we will... Uh, collect this decay into an auxiliary state S, S is for sync. We consider this a born Markov process. So we model it with the uh, Lindblad master equation, which is written here. So this models like decay of the excited states to states which are outside this three level system. So whatever the case from E is lost. The goal of the protocol we want to develop is to transfer population from state G to state R by modifying, by giving the shape, the time shape of the pulses, omega P and omega S. By the way, omega P is called pump pulse usually, omega S is called Stokes pulse. So in order to do this, uh, figure merit to say how good we are in doing this transfer, is the fidelity, which we define simply as the population at the final time on the state R, on our target state. And sorry, I didn't say it. Uh, you can interrupt me whenever you want during my talk. I don't see raised hands, so just talk and interrupt me if you want. Okay. 
All right, so since we are here, if I may start with the questions, yes. why do you specifically are looking for the process of full state transfer rather than creating an arbitrary superposition between ground and R? It, it, it can be possible, but this is just an example. Just to, So it actually, it doesn't change much. It's the same thing, but this is the simplest thing that one can describe. So since this is a tutorial, we wanted to try it to the simplest thing. Indeed. But uh, uh, ideally, it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad to hear that it's the same, that it doesn't become more complex. It's no. not trivial. It does. Yes. Then, um, now I will introduce you what is Syrup, which is a protocol that's, that does this population transfer. So Syrup is an adiabatic protocol. This is an adiabatic pro protocol that allows for population transfers from G to R with fidelity close to one. And during this evolution, the population of the excited state is kept low. And this is why not so much population is lost. And so it can reach fidelity. Uh, close to one. In order to explain this protocol, I will first introduce the adiabatic theorem. So given a time-dependent Hamiltonian, it's, it's instantaneous against states, n of t, and it's instantaneous again energies, L e n of t. So this means that we just diagonalize the Hamiltonian at each time step, at each, at each instant in time. Then you have instantaneous against states and instantaneous against values. So Given this, uh, in general, the solution of the, of the time dependent Schrodinger equation is a linear combination on, of all the instantaneous against state. But if uh, H0 is slowly varying and uh, the initial state is an instantaneous against state, let's say M, then the evolution follows that instantaneous against state. Uh, you can visualize it in this way. Here on the y-axis, we have the eigenvalues, which represent the eigenstate at that eigenvalues. And on the right axis, we have the time. And let's suppose, and uh, um, so these are the instantaneous, the lines are the instantaneous eigenvalues, which represent the instantaneous eigenstate. Let's suppose you start in an eigenstate, the green one, then if the, the um, Hamiltonian H0 slows, va slows, um, varies slows in, slowly in time, then the evolution will remain on the same instantaneous eigenstate, meaning that the transition probabilities to other eigenstate is, is very small. So now let's consider this, the debatic theorem in the case of the three-level system. So this is the Hamiltonian that I wrote before and uh, just in matrix form. And these are its instantaneous against state, okay? Uh, but we are interested only in this against state, H0, which uh, has no component on the excited state and depends on theta. And theta is related to the Rabe frequency via this formula. So you can see already that this is an instantaneous against state, an instantaneous against state, which has no component on the excited states, and but has components on both the, ground, the initial and the target state. So if we manage to use the debatic theory, so to, uh, um, take, to take advantage of the debatic theorem, so always riding in this state, we will never populate the excited state but we will we'll be able to make population transfer. And never populating the excited state is good because the excited state is the state that loses population. So let's see how this can be done. Now, if the pulses are counterintuitively ordered, so I mean, we first turn on omega s, the stock pulse that couples to empty levels, and then turn on omega p, then, uh, let's see what happens in the equation. So these are the equations that says, these equations tells that the um, pulses are counterintuitively ordered. In fact, here at the beginning for T that goes to the initial time, omega P is zero, 
for t to the final time, omega s is zero. This means counterintuitively ordered. But this also means that theta at the initial time is zero, and theta at the final time is pi over two. So if at, so this also means that if theta at the final part, at, the final, at the initial time is zero, then the initial state is G. And if theta at the final time is pi over two, then the final state is minus R, which is what we want. So if this is an example, if you have the pulses counter, counterintuitively ordered like this, theta, uh, like this, which is the upper plot, here we have the pulses as a function of time, here we have theta as a function of time. We see that the theta goes from zero to, to pi. And so if you are adiabatic, if you are adiabatic, uh, we will always stay in this state and we will go directly from G to R without ever populating E. Of course, this happens only if you are adiabatic. The adiabatic condition uh, can be stated more rigorously, but in general, it's just that the area of the pulses and their overlap should be large. So what it's important to remember about STIRA is that it allows for efficient population transfer in a three-level system. It is characterized by the counterintuitive, con counterintuitive order of the pulses and is an adiabatic process. So the areas, the areas of the pulses must be large and they should be very large. Uh, yes. Let me have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, but like, uh, what is the benefit of using stir up instead just of single pulse, which can go from like G to R because your excited state has, I guess, higher energy than R? Because sometimes um, this is avoided by the um, selection rules. For example, in an atom, if you can mm -hmm. dipole couple, G with E and E with R, you cannot directly couple with the dipole G with R. Okay. But I think the question was, uh, so how does uh, the stir up compares with the direct time independent Raman process? So if one were to take the Delta big, then one could think, oh, I, I'm considering just um, the level E of far detuned and I can just consider the Raman process between G and R. Of course, both of these, uh, scenarios have a restriction condition of the time because the Raman process requires the fire detuning that slows down the process and the steer up requires adiabaticity. So the question I think it was, uh, how do they compare time-wise? So I think in general, steer up uh, is considered better. It, it is also more robust. Time-wise, I don't know, but... Uh, Yes. Thank you. So I think yes, it is it is rather insensitive to fluctuations of omega p and omega s, while fluctuations of the amplitude of the drive uh, uh, makes a difference in uh, in atmospheric uh, population with drama. Uh-huh. Yes, so in the Raman, in the end, if you do this, you have to have, so the pulses, so you, you, like, you do like a pi pulse to transfer the population, and so the areas of the pulses must be very precise. If Indeed. you change that, you don't have it. That is very interesting. Thank Instead, you. with stira, this is not, uh, it's, it's robust against fluctuation, so the shape of the pulses is not so much important. Absolutely. What's I'm convinced. It's just that they are counterintuitive. I'm convinced. Thank you. The, there is another another thing is that is that it's faithful. If you have many many levels, it is able to address the right one. Okay. Okay. Then. So we know what to remember from syrup. And I will, I will give a super, very short mention of uh, optimal control because we are expert. So consider a system described by a set of differential equations where rho is the state of the system, f is a smooth, smooth function, and u are the controls that we can control from outside. And we suppose an evolution of, in the interval of time from zero to capital T. Then 
one can introduce a cost functional whose minimization corresponds to, to the desired dynamics. And in the case of uh, population transfer, the cost functional can be just one minus the fidelity. So one minus the population of the target state at the final time. And the goal of optimal control is to find the controls which minimize this cost functional. In the case of the three-level system, the set of linear differential equation is the master equation that I showed before. This is the decay part with gamma that I showed before explicitly. And this is again the Hamiltonian. And the control, of course, are the Rabi frequencies, omega p and omega s. So one wants to find with optimal control, with optimal control methods, the omega p and omega s, which which um, maximize these, which minimize, sorry, this cost functional. So uh, what we did, uh, we did a very simple uh, optimal control technique. We just split the time interval in n smaller intervals of equal length, and we consider the pulses to be fixed in each time step, okay? So in this case, each Rabi frequency, omega p and omega s, so they are step function, and each of them is parameterized by n real numbers. And then we minimize the cost function that in this case depends by two n real numbers. With this can be minimized with any methods for minimizing um, multivariate functions. And so the this function depends now on two n real variable, and this can be minimized in order to give the, um, the pulses that we want. Uh, we did this very basically. We just used um, gradient descent with Adam, and we, we used, um, we computed the derivative numerically. This was also feasible. So it would just take a few minutes for each point. And these are the results that we obtained. Now, uh, to understand this plot, you can consider T fixed. And on the x-axis, the maximum allowed value of the pulses is given. On the y-axis is given the infidelity. So the lower, the better. And these two rows, so these two colors, are for two different values of the decay rate gamma. Of course, lower, lower decay rate, T gamma equal one, is better, gives a better fidelity, while higher um, gamma gives a higher fidelity. But in both cases, we see that with increasing omega max, we can, uh, the fidelity goes, the fidelity increases. This is the infidelity. So the fidelity increases. And you can also see this as on the right, we are more adiabatic. We can be more adiabatic, or we have more energy that we can put in the system, or yes, we have more energy that we can put in the system. And now I will show the, the pulses and the evolution for these three points, which are given here. So on the top, um, so on the top panels, there is the obtained pulses. And in the bottom panels, there is the, the evolution, the relative evolution. So let's start from the right, which is the one which has the maximum amount. So in which let's say T is fixed and omega max can be um, 100 over T. So it's very large. And we see that in this case, uh, the pulses are counterintuitively ordered also here. So first there is omega S, the stock pulse, and then there is omega P, the pump pulse. And they kind of maximize the area at their disposal. The area at their disposal is exactly T over omega max, and they somehow have also a very large overlap. And you see this produces a very smooth transition to the final state and the fidelity here is very large. I don't remember that one much, like 99%, 0.9, something like this. Isn't well, that pulse very similar to stirrup in the end? Yes, they are very similar to stirrup, yes. In fact, this is the, let's say, the meaning of these slides that in the end, 
These pulses have the characteristic of stirrup, which they are counterintuitively ordered, and they have a large area, and they have an overlap. And also for smaller uh, maximum uh, um, rabbit frequencies, max, um, omega max, we see also that the pulses are counterintuitively counter ordered, but there, is, but there is a small bump at the beginning and at the end, let's say, of the wrong, uh, of the wrong um, pulse. We, and this, is, this appears even more, uh, this is seen also more in when omega max is even smaller, where the small bump, the small bump is larger. But in general, if you neglect the small bumps, they are counterintuitively ordered. So I don't know very well what, what is the use of these um, small bumps at the beginning. I assume somehow they, they increase the fidelity, otherwise optimal control will not have done that. But I didn't check um, uh, specifically what they do. So these are the results that we obtain with this simple optimal control method. Now I will give a brief idea of reinforcement learning. In particular, I will talk about Markov decision processes, policies, how the goals are connected to rewards and returns, value function. In the end, I will explain, try to explain a reinforcement learning method, which is called reinforce. So, Let's start with Markov decision processes. What are Markov decision processes? They are a classical for formalization of uh, sequential decision making. Uh, in, in, in where actions influence not only just immediate rewards, but also subsequent situations that, that can happen far long in the future. And they are a mathematically idealized form of the reinforcement learning problem for which precise theoretical statements can be made. But I will not be so rigorous and there will be some small imprecision is what I'm going to say. But I, I, want to, I hope I can give an idea of how this works. So the mark of decision process framework consists in an agent and an environment interacting with each other. The agent is the learner, is the one that makes the decision. The environment is everything else, is everything that interacts with the agent. Now, you don't have confused when we say in physics environment, which is usually the part of the system that we are not interested in, and is the one that we want to trace away. In this case, instead, the environment is exactly the system we are interested in, is the system we want to study. You will see this better later. So we have agent and environment interacting with each other at discrete time steps. At each time step, the agent receives a state and a reward. Uh, re so receives a representation of the state's environment and the reward. Thanks to this state, and reward, the agent selects an action and applies it on the environment. The environment, because this action has been applied to it, reaches a new state, ST plus one, and produces a new reward, RT plus one. And the cycle goes on. So going on this cycle, uh, this interaction gives rise to a trajectory. We consider, we start from R, so we consider the reward zero, the initial reward like to be zero. So we start from the initial state, then there is the action, then again reward, state, action, and so on, until uh, the end step. So actually, this uh, interaction could go on forever. And there are problems that are treated like this. For example, if you have, um, um, if you want to control the air conditioning of a big building, maybe you want to build an agent that does this continuously. So in which this interaction goes on, let's say almost forever. It's not spontaneously broken into small uh, parts. 
or also if you think that you want to build a robot that wants to live a life. While instead, there are some other um, problems in which it, it um, spontaneously can be thought of as broken into smaller episodes. And uh, these are called episodic tasks, which, which is, for example, a game of chess. When you play chess, you finish a match, then you start the game from the initial state, and so on. And also, yes, and so on. And so we will consider only this here, episodic task. So this uh, trajectory will be finite. And this trajectory can also call one trajectory can also be called an episode. And after each episode, the environment is reset to an initial state. So the environment is complete, completely characterized by the dynamics function. The dynamics function which is P S prime, S prime R S A gives the probability that at time step T, the environment is in state S prime and gives the reward S. If at time step T minus one, the environment was in state S and received the action A. So practically you can think of this as the transition function of the, of the environment. So I am the environment, I am in state test. I receive the action A from the agent. What is the probability that, that I will be in state S prime and that I will give the reward R? This is the dynamics function. Given this, you have described completely the environment. And you can see this allows also for non-deterministic environment. So for an environment that if I am in, in this state, in the same state, I receive the same action, but my transition can be uh different with different probabilities this also includes this also includes this case then uh, one important thing is the markov property which is that the dynamics function should depend only on the state and the action at the previous time so um so the state at time t and the reward at time t should depend only on the state at times t minus one and on the actions at times t minus one. But actually, this is not a restriction on the dynamic of the process, but it is more a requirement on the representation of the state. So with the, this dynamic function, with as the Markov property, you can also describe non-Markovian processes. The simplest things that you can do. So you have to define the state such that the state has the Markov property, but not the dynamic of the process that you want to describe as the Markov property. For example, you can simply describe the state as the list of all the past state that the environment was in. Every time the environment reaches a new state, you add it to the list. You create an history of the of the, the environment state and you consider these as the representation of the state of the environment. You could do this, and this, of course, will have the Markov property, but we'll be able to describe non-Markovian dynamics. Now, what is to remember about the MDP framework? So the MDP framework is an abstraction of the problem of goal-directed learning from interaction. And uh, uh, it states that this problem can be solved considering, considering only three signals passing back and forth between the agent and the environment. These three signals are the actions, which are the choices that the agent makes, the states, which are the basis of which the choices are made, and the rewards. And the rewards are connected to the agent's goal, to what we want to do. So, when one has to define a problem in this framework, one has to formalize it. What does it mean? One has to say, what are the actions? What are the states? What are the reward? And what is the environment dynamics function? And at the end, the actions is what one learns. One learns the actions of the agent such that its interaction with the environment does what we want to do. Now we are going to see how. For example, in the case of the three-level system, now I formulate the, 
three-level population, tra three population transfer problem as a MDP, mark of decision process. But this is only one way in which it can be formulated. It can be formulated in many different ways, I think infinite ways, but this is the most straightforward for me. So the environment is the three-level system and its evolution. The agent chooses which passes to apply on the system, so on the environment. So remember, we have a trajectory, and the states are the density matrix of the, of the three-level system. So the states of the environment are the density matrix of the system. The actions are the couple of pulses, the, a couple of real numbers that the agents apply to the environment. The dynamics function is simply the evolution of the quantum system according to the Lindblad master equation. So we have that the new state is given by this formula, which depends on the actions given, given to the environment and the old state of the environment. This is the same. The new states depends on the old state and the actions received. But so in this way, we have formalized the three-level population transfer problem as a mark of decision process. It's only missing the rewards because we have the state, actions, dynamics function, the rewards. Here is how I decided to give the rewards, which and the rewards are always zero until the end. At the last step, the reward is the population of the target state. Uh, you will understand why we made this, this choice better later when I talk about rewards. Do you have any questions until now? Doesn't the algorithm get puzzled that Can for a very, think? so doesn't the algorithm get puzzled that for a very long time, the reward is completely degenerate? Actually, in, uh, so these can happen in situations where the space of um, search is very large. I mean, in this case, instead, we have n time step. It will always reach. So it will always reach the end state. So with it, at each episode, we'll always see a reward. If uh, the, the system was like go out of a maze, this may be a problem because the maze will be very difficult and the agent trying may never reach the end. So it will never have a reward. But in this case, which the episode is fixed, the length of the episode is fixed, it will always have a reward on each episode. So this won't happen. I see. Okay. Any other question? Okay, then, but what's missing? How does the agent chooses the action? How do agents learn what actions are good in order to achieve our goal? Or in other words, what is the agent? So the agent chooses the actions using a policy function. A policy P is a mapping from states to probabilities of selecting actions. So. If, an, if we say that an agent follows policy P at time T, it means that in state S, the agents to choose actions A with probability PAS. PAS is a probability distribution over the actions for each state S. What does it mean? It means that if the agent receives the state S from the environment, it will choose action A with probability PAS. So again, here, this includes non-deterministic agents. So the agent in the same state can choose to do different actions. And this is how the agent chooses which action to do by using the policy function. Now, reinforcement learning methods specify how the agent's policy is changed as a result of each interaction with the environment in order to achieve our goal. So given an agent, given an environment, reinforcement learning methods establish how the policy of the agent changes 
such that in the end, the agents does what we want on the environment. Um, how do we say to the agents what we want on the environment? This is a small like philosophical slide. There is something that computer scientists called reward hypothesis, which states that all what we mean by goals and purpose, purposes can be well thought of as the maximization of the expected value of a cumulative sum of received sala scalar signal, the reward. Don't, don't worry, we'll explain this um, more, uh, a bit more mathematically later. So this means that maximizing a cumulative sum of rewards imply that you, you achieve your goal. So what they want to say is that you can always, if you have a goal, you can define the problem as maximizing the cumulative sum of the rewards. And uh, so it is important to notice that the reward is not the place to impart the agent prior knowledge about how to achieve what you want to do. In the, in the reward, we have to say what you want, not how. This is also why we choose these uh, reward because our goal is that at the end of the process we have maximum population we don't care what's happening at the during the process uh, you can also think for example if you have uh, you are playing chess and you may think oh if i take the opponent's queen it's good but it may not be the best choice to take the opponent's queen in order to win the game so you don't want to give an, a good reward if it takes the opponent queen, you want to give the reward only if you win the game. Or for example, here, you can say you one could think of, I will put here as a reward in the travel system case, I mean, I will put here as a reward at each time step, the population of the, of the target state. But this will not give you the maximum population at the end, because maybe in order to populate the, um, target state faster to populate it before, then at the end, you will have uh, less population on the final state. Luigi, I have a question. Hi. Yes. Um, so this makes this makes perfect sense to me that you are putting the, uh, the how in a different place than the what. What I'm wondering though, is when I'm learning chess, in the beginning, it makes sense for me to do some obvious moves because they improve the probability that in the end I will get something all right out of it, like when I'm just learning. So is there such a strategy to maybe change this reward over time in order to start from a uh, start with the reward that's easier to achieve somehow? So um, I think that for problems which, in which the computation can be done very easily, I think that the best choice to do is to anyway put only on the reward what you want. Yes, yes, Directly of course, that do. makes perfect. I'm yes. thinking of something that's instead, really hard to do. In yeah. fact, if, instead, if something is hard, I think what you say, it has been done, it, it's being done, and also, uh, one thing is that one can change the policy without actually uh, change, changing the expected return. So, um, so you you can uh, so there are various ways actually this is a very complicated thing. There are various ways in which you can impart prior knowledge into the into the um, agent one is the one that you said and that's how you change the reward how the reward is given over time another one is that you start with a policy that in certain situation does what you think is good um, another way is that you will see that the expected return which means uh, how much so how much how good is the agent so there are different policies that have the same 
that are good the same way, let's say. I, I cannot explain it what I've said until now. There, there are different policies that uh, achieve the same goal in the same way. So you can change one policy in order to make it do what you want in certain case without ever changing the overall behavior of it. So if it is an optimal policy, you can slightly change it still and it will still remain an optimal policy. Okay. Uh, but one has to see the math behind it to understand this. Okay, I think I think I have an idea of how something like that could work. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Then, okay. Now I will uh, try to make this slide a bit more mathematical, a bit more rigorous by giving you some definitions. So remember a trajectory, which goes from, there are T plus one steps, T steps, we define the dis discounted return, which is, so at each time step T, notice this, is, this depends on this time step, the return is the sum of the future reward. And the future reward are weighted with gamma, uh, with the power of gamma. Gamma is the discount rate. RK is the reward at time step. K and T is the termination step. So um, we define the reward. At that, so for a single trajectory, you have to remember that at time t equals zero, you have a certain discounted return. Then at time step one, you have another discounted return and so on. And uh, the agent, the goal of the agent is that at each time step, the agent wants to maximize the expected return g of t. Uh, you can, then one can consider these uh, extreme cases. If gamma equals zero, so the expected return is only, the return is only R plus one, the agent will try to maximize only the immediate reward. While if, and this is called the myopic agent. If instead the agent, the gamma is close to one, then the agent is more farsighted and it will try to maximize the sum of all rewards. We, does we it still reset the, at the end of an episode? Sorry? So at the end of an episode, it still resets, right? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Good. This is given for each episode. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, we will use gamma equal one. So we consider just the sum of all the rewards until the end of the process. And actually, this is done very often in um, problems in episodic tasks. The problem with, if there's this problem is the task is not episodic. So if uh, the trajectory goes forever, if you don't have gamma, this can, the, this contraton could diverge. So there are also other ways to avoid this, but we have episodic task. So the trajectory is finite. And so we can easily consider just the sum of all the rewards from from the next step until the end. And uh, remember, it's important, in order to achieve our goal, the agent has to maximize the expected return. This is the connection between achieving the goal and the reward signal. Uh, now, I will give you some other definition. The state value function for a policy pi, you can imagine it as the value of the state S under policy pi. It is the expected return where starting in state S and following pi thereafter. Notice this depends both on the policy and not on the state. For example, let's consider the Markov decision process of football. And let's consider Messi having the ball 20 meters, the, the agent Messi, having the ball 20 meters from the opponent goal, which is a state, or 40 meters from the opponent goal, which is another state. The value of the state being 20 meters far from the opponent goal, maybe for the agent Messi, maybe will be better than 
the value of the state being 40 meters away from the opponent goal for the same agent mass. So the state value function depends on the state, but it also depends on the policy. If we don't have, if the agent is not messy, but the agent is me, the value of the same state being 20 meters outside, uh, far from the opponent goal, of course, will be lower. So my policy in playing football is worse than the policy of Messi. So the value functions depends on the state and on the policy. And also the action value function is defined in a similar way. It's the value of taking action A in state S under policy pi, which means what is the expected return starting from state S, taking action A and then following policy pi thereafter. So there are, these are two important functions that are used in many reinforcement learning algorithms, but we will not use them. And also you may ask, how can I know what is the expected return? So uh, usually if the problem is, sometimes it can be calculated from, from some equations, if you, know very, if you know very well the environment, if you don't know the environment, then you can approximate these value functions with the interaction from the environment. So the value function, this is very important, can be estimated from experience, from the interaction with the environment. And I repeat, these are used in many reinforcement learning algorithms, but we will not use this. This right now, just a um, summary of the MDP framework. So we have an agent and an environment which has changed three signals, state, reward, and action. The environment is characterized by the dynamics function. The agent takes actions following a policy and reinforcement learning methods specify how to change the agent's policy in order to achieve our goal. And this is done by maximizing the expected return. State value function and, active, and action value function can be used to maximize the expected return. But, but now I will talk about another method, which is a policy gradient method, which is called reinforce. So I will say br briefly what are, what are considered policy, policy gradient methods. So suppose you have a policy and you parameterize this policy with a vector pi, we call it like this. So this is the probability that the agent, if receives state S, takes action A when the parameters are theta, okay? Then one introduces a scalar performance, J of theta, and one maximizes the performance with approximate gradient ascent. This is the typical for, uh, update rule for the gradient ascent, where weighted grad of J is a stochastic estimate of the gradient of J. This is a general schema that uh, and methods that follow this general schema are called policy gradients method. Now, I will introduce you, I will explain what is the reinforce. In the reinforce, the performance measure is the state value of the, of the initial state. So J of theta is the state value of the initial state. And you can see that if we maximize this, we achieve our goal because we maximize, we, we, we start from the initial state. The initial state in our case, but it's fixed, let's say, okay. Then we maximize the expected return that we obtain from the initial state. So we change our policies such that we maximize the expected return from the initial state. And this is, this is a key in our goal. Uh, one, once you do this, you can calculate analytically the gradient of J, which is given here. And this, um, so of course, you know how you parameterize your policy. So you know how to take this gradient. You can do it analytically also. And uh, then this gives the reinforce update, how you update the theta. Um, and you can do it by sampling. So here there is the expected, this is the expectation value of this uh, quantity. And in order to calculate the expectation value, what we do is that you simply sample it. So 
So you make the agent interacting within, with the environment, sampling this and calculating the expectation value. And this gives rise to this update formula. Here is the algorithm for reinforce. Okay, so suppose we have a policy P theta parameterized by theta. So given initial gas of theta, generate a complete episode from zero to T following the policy pi theta. Then for each time step T, calculate the return and up use the update rule update the parameter theta. Then, if not converged, run another episode. And so on. In this way, after convergence, the agent that follows policy pi theta will maximize j of theta, which means will maximize the state value of the initial state which so reached our goal. In uh, our uh, tutorial, this is uh, our policy function. So this is our agent, let's say. Uh, our agent takes as input, so we said the state is the density matrix, right? So the, our agent takes the density matrix as an input. Actually, <clears throat> we don't consider the part of the density matrix due to the sink. And so we have only nine real numbers of interest. So the input layer of our neural network, because so I said, we approximate our policy with a neural network. We parameterize our policy with a neural network. The input layer is nine, has nine neurons, which are the values of the state. Then we have other two or three large layers. And at the end, we have two neurons, which gives two values. One values for the pump, one values for the stokes pulses. But these are not the actual values that will be given to the environment. These are the mean of two Gaussians. Okay. And then after having this mean, the action will be sampled under these Gaussians. So the real value that will be given to the, uh, to the environment as an action will be sampled from a Gaussian which have the mean, which is the output of this neural network. And also in the end, this is just uh, in order, we, we want to keep the range of the uh, Rabi frequency fixes, so we want it to be between zero and omega max. So at the end, there is also also a pass with a hyperbolic tangent function, uh, function to keep to make it to fit, to make it fit in the correct range. So this is our policy, and the parameters, of course, are the parameters of the neural network. So this is our agent. Then the agent chooses the actions, which are the amplitudes of the rabbi frequencies that we give to, the our, to our environment. Our environment calculates the next state and gives the next state to the agents together with the reward that we said what it is. In this way, it builds a trajectory and then we use reinforce to search for the optimal policy. And this is the result. So on the X section, on the X, we have the iteration. Actually, one iteration is two episodes in this case. And on the Y, we have the return. And the return is actually the fidelity. So we see that at the beginning, with random parameters of our policy, the efficiency was lower than 0 0.2. And then it quickly grows. And after 500 iteration, it's almost 0 0.9, which is actually slight slightly lower than the one we obtained with optimal control with the same parameters. But one has to take into account that also here there is uh, more randomness going on in the algorithm. And, and specifically, I saw that you did not, so the sigma of those Gaussians is not an output of your neural network. Yes, it's fixed. Why? 
uh, it can be changed. Usually it's done that you, you start with a large Gaussian and then you decrease it with time. But in this case, with, uh, keeping it constant and small was enough to make this work. You don't think that uh, your lower fidelity could be due to that? Yes, it can be due to that. So it can be due to many things. We did not optimize any hyperparameter. So this, um, there are many hyperparameters, both for optimal control, but for reinforcement learning algorithms, like the number of neurons in the neural network, the sigma, other things, learning rate, and we did not optimize them. We just found some that work and we stuck with them. We, like, like the standard one that were there worked more or less uh, soon, and so we kept them. Okay. <clears throat> and then this is the result. So on the left, you can see the pulses. You see again that they look like counterintuitive. There is first the stock pulse, and first the stock pulse is turned on, and then the pump pulse. And there is somehow again the small bump only at the beginning of the pump pulse. Don't know. And this is the evolution of the system, which is what one expects. So for discussion and conclusion, this is not the comparison between optimal control theory and reinforcement learning. We did not use any, we did not use the state of the art algorithm for any of those. We did not optimize any hyperparameter. We just wanted to find something that works in a let's say, easy way and simple to understand. However, in the way we implemented it, the three parameter for, for optimal control are 60. The three parameter for reinforcement learning are 7,644. The computational cost of optimal control is around 100 times shorter than the one for reinforcement learning. But of course, depends greatly on the hardware available, GPUs and CPUs. And both uh, methods easily solve the problem of population transfer in three-level system, giving stirrup-like pulses. But optimal control theory gives slight better result. And uh, if you want, you can see the code, some of the code that we used on this GitHub repository. And this is the end. So thanks a lot, uh, Luigi. It was really uh, interactive and means that, yeah, uh, it was really useful to um, have this kind of conversation, I would say. Um, yeah, I think if anybody uh, wants to ask further questions, so theoretically we are, uh, it's already 11 something, so people have to leave, uh, feel free to leave of course, uh, but we can go on with the conversation. Um, Martino, do you maybe want to ask something? I saw you. Uh, yes, absolutely. So hi Luigi, thanks for the hi, nice talk. Um, so, what you use to inform the policy at each step, uh, if I correctly understand, is the density matrix of the system, which of course is something that you can get uh, if you are running a simulation. So, I was wondering, do you think there is a chance that we can uh, rephrase this uh, framework so that you can actually use it uh, on, uh, on an experiment where you don't have access to. Yes, so of course. Value of some operator. So actually you don't need to, so for this particular case, you don't need to measure the density matrix at each time step in the experiment because you can just mm -hmm. uh, say what is the initial. So you can just put it on the computer, simulate it, and then you have the, the pulses that you need to put on your experiment. So like mm -hmm. to, to, to be, oops. But that still requires the, you to have a model on your computer that uh, supposedly should do exactly the same thing that the yes. 